Welcome everybody to the Cognitive Rampage podcast. I have been looking forward to this one. Our guest on the show today, author, tutor, researcher, man of many parts, John Hands is on, the author of Cosmo Sapiens, which we're going to get deep into, but uh, a little bit about John. Uh, is he devoted more than 10 years to evaluating scientific theories about human evolution from the origin of the universe? It resulted in the seven page book we just talked about, Cosmo Sapiens. Uh, he graduated in chemistry from the University of London, where he was the first undergraduate president of the union. He founded the Society for Cooperative Dwellings, co authored two research studies, published housing cooperatives and scripted, directed, and presented a documentary called More Than a Place to Live, broadcast twice on BBC television. He's the, he's the founding director of the UK government's cooperative housing agency and served on the committees appointed by the Minister for Housing, a Secretary of State for the Environment, and a Secretary of State for Industry. He is tutored in both physics and management studies for the Open University and was a visiting lecturer in creative writing at the University of North London and then Royal Literary, Literary Fund Fellow at the University College of London. He's written three critically acclaimed novels, including Cosmo Sapiens, which we're going to get into, uh, well, research book, I should say. Um, to give you a little background on Cosmo Sapiens. I don't want to go too far. I'd rather John walk us through it personally, but uh, it's a groundbreaking book that transforms our understanding of what we are, where we came from, and why we exist. It shows that key theories usually presented as facts, such as the Big Bang, Neo-Darwinism, are contradicted by the 21st century evidence. I am so looking forward to learning. John Hans, thank you for coming on the podcast. You're welcome, Adam. Um, you were you broke up um, many times during the introduction, so I hope it doesn't break up at this end too. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> half the introduction went in, in breakups. It was but great. Never mind. Uh, it was great. You should have heard it. It was amazing. It was probably the best intro ever done for you uh, at any time. Uh, it is just. It was terrific. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I basically was just reading, trying to summarize quite an extensive history, resume, and work you've performed. As I read over it um, when I was uh, first looking you up from the book, I was just thrown, I was, I was enamored. I was like, wow, the man has put some work in, uh, in his community, in his proximity around him, and into what we believe is science and evolution and human beings, our human experience. And that's really what I was uh, referencing your books as well as uh, all the cooperative housing things you've done uh, and more so. But uh, that's essentially the opening summarized again. Right. Um, well, if, if I can talk about Cosmos Sapiens, uh, Adam. Um, after my wife died from cancer, I began to ask myself, what are we? Where do we come from? Why do we exist? These are questions that he's been asking for at least 25,000 years. During all of that time, answers in the supernatural. Then about 3,000 years ago, uh, we began to seek answers through philosophical reasoning and insight. And then about 150 years ago, we began to seek answers through science, through systematic, preferably measurable observation or experiment. As a science student and former tutor in physics at the Open University, I wanted to find out answers to what science currently gives. But I couldn't find any book that did, Adam. And there were two reasons for this. Uh, first, the exponential increase in empirical data generated by rapid development of technology has resulted in the branching of science into increasingly narrow specialized fields. I would step back and from the focus of one leaf on one branch and see what the whole evolutionary tree shows us. Second, most science books advocate a particular theory and often present it as fact. The scientific explanation changes as new data is obtained and new thinking develops. So I decided to write the book that hadn't been written, an impartial evaluation as far as possible of the current theories that explain how we evolved, not just from the first life on Earth, 
But where did that come from? Where did that come from? Where did that come from? Right back to the primordial matter and energy at the beginning of the universe, which we ultimately consist. I have to say, Adam, when my friends wanted to be supportive, they said, John, that is ambitious. When they wanted to be realistic, they said, John, that's mad. In my saner moments, I agreed with the latter. Uh, <clears throat> the book took me more than 10 years to research and write, wow. uh, but the conclusions I read surprised me. I, I couldn't imagine studying for 10 years and putting the work in. I, I can see where um, you're... Oh, you're breaking up a little bit there, John. I apologize. I interrupted as you. Well as well as science. Evil and matter. And it turned to nine chapters because the more I investigated, the more I discovered that the Big Bang Theory had been contradicted by observational evidence many, many years ago. And cosmologists have continually changed this theory as more sophisticated observations and experiments produce yet more contradictions with the theory. Now, the current model is called, they call it the concordance model. It's more accurately described as the inflationary before or after the hot big bang, unknown dark matter, unknown dark energy model. Um, it invokes dark matter to account for 27% of the universe. 30 years of investigation have failed to identify what dark matter is. When the Large Hadron Collider was reopened last year um, with much greater energy, there was an experiment to identify what dark matter could be. They actually failed to do so. Now, they quite rightly lauded the fact and publicized the fact that they they just the Higgs boson. We were dark matter, we haven't found it. Dark energy is evoked to account for 68% of the universe and to account for the universe changing from a gradually decelerating expansion to, a, to an increasing ex accelerating expansion after two thirds of its life. 20 years of investigation have failed to identify what this mysterious anti-gravity dark energy is. So we have a current theory that actually fails to account for 95% of, of the universe. I don't call that a pretty solid theory. Um, and it's central axiom that the universe inflated at a trillion, trillion times speed of light in a trillion, trillion times, a trillion, trillion to the second is untestable. Hence, it's not scientific. Mm. Um, and no rational explanation of the of cosmology uh, 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 gives an explanation of how everything burst into existence out of nothing. Now the problem arises, Adam, because these cosmological theories are mathematical models. They are simplified solutions to Einstein's field equations of general relativity applied to the universe. But they're based on, on assumptions that the latest observations show to be invalid. For example, one assumption is that the universe is homogeneous. It's all the same. Now, we know it's not true um, because when you look at the night sky, you see the Milky Way. It's not all the same. But the assumption was well, the scale of the universe it, it's more or less all the same. But every single exp um, survey of the universe, and the latest one last year, showed an object of 14 billion light years across. You know, it is not homogeneous. So the central assumptions fall. Um, so I was surprised to and to find out that you no, know, it's it, it's it's not a scientific explanation. It's it's a mathematical speculation, 
And I'm, I'm afraid the current cosmologist um, didn't read the Einstein because he himself was quite open about it, that it was a mathematical thing and it may not well be true. Um, he was quite open about this, but cosmologists tend to make the assumption that, that it's true. I, I, and I'll give you one example, Adam. I had lunch with the then um, president of the Royal Astronomical Society in the United Kingdom, and he found out that I was a novelist, and so he started giving me critiques of, of modern literature, which was fine. I had no problem with that. And so I said, well, you know, thanks very much. Um, I May I send you a draft chapter on cosmology? And you can show me, you know, because I'm not an expert like you are, you can check for errors of fact, omission, or eligible conclusions. And he said, yeah, I'm delighted to do so, John. And he then emailed me back, um, a week later saying, I'm not prepared to support an attack on cosmology. And I said, oh, no, sorry, what do you mean, an attack on cosmology? I've shown uh, different alternative views, apart from the current one, by very reputable astronomers. And, he's, and, I, and I quoted one. And he said, oh, he's got no credibility. He, in fact, had awarded that very same person the Royal Society's gold medal two years before. What? And I said, in a, <coughs> what? yes, and I said, so I'm not talking about off the wall, you know, people. I'm talking about people with solid reputations here who challenge the current model. And I said, well, what actually do you, tell me what's wrong. Fine, just tell me what is wrong in a chapter I've written. And he said, you said that the WMAP survey um, is not consistent with the inflation theory. I said, yes. He said, well, most, most cosmologists think it is. I said, have you read the footnotes? that I give, the references, because I cite, for example, two things. One, a chapter in your book, which reaches the same conclusion. And two, an article you wrote in Nature, which reaches the same conclusion. So this is rather a sad defensive um, reaction to people from within who regarded as heretics and people from without who were regarded as unbelievers. And I, I think it's sad because science shouldn't be like that. Uh, science should be taking, looking at the evidence and, and changing theory if it doesn't match up to what the theory says. And I, and I came across um, a, 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 another surprising conclusion when I examined the Orthodox theory for the last 65 years in the UK and USA. And I stress, Adam, the UK and the USA, not the same in Russia or in France, of how and why life on Earth evolved into so many different species. It's known as neonism and was popularized by Richard Dawkins in his best selling book, The Selfish Gene. Now it says that biological evolution is caused by genes selfishly competing with each other to survive and replicate. Now it's based on the fallacy of ascribing intention to an acid, deoxyribonucleic acid in which genes are composed. Now Dawkins admits that this language is sloppy and says he could express it in scientific terms. I read the book twice. Moreover, it's a model contradicted by substantial behavioral, genetic, and genomic evidence. And when confronted by this evidence, instead of modifying the theory to counter the evidence as a scientist should do, Dawkins lamely says, quote, genes must have misfired. In fact, Adam, he couldn't have modified the theory because the evidence shows that Darwinian competition 
causes not the evolution of species, but the destruction of species. It is collaboration, not competition, that's caused the evolution of successively more complex species. Whoa, yeah, oh my, my God. So you, you already walked the, my gosh. Sorry, that just hits me. It's not the evolution as we're competing for survival, but yet how we work together that has caused the species to spread out and different and evolve yeah. and grow. Yeah, because Darwinian competition, um, it, that account 95% of, of what happens, which is destruction of species. for the evolution of new species by such mechanisms as um, as hybridization which involves the sharing of whole new genomes um, horizontal gene transfer all these mechanisms are, are well established scientifically but they've been ignored by American and British evolutionary biologists uh, they put to one side and thought well they're not important because they actually contradict the near darwinian theory and it, it, i mean in this country darwin is regarded as kind of a secular saint and so everyone say well yeah an evolution biologist um my my theory is darwinian and so the it, it's it's still a religion view, it's still like a religion. It becomes yeah. almost dogmatic, yeah. is what you see, and nobody wants it, to turn it, against it. It has been done, uh, exactly. Uh, it, it is regarded as this, and it, it is not science. And fortunately, there are you know, very reputable um, scientists who don't take this view. But, uh, and there was a conference um, about 18 months ago organized by... Um, the Royal Society and the British Academy um, held at the Royal Society's <coughs> headquarters, which actually challenged this view and um, was outstanding thinkers <coughs> like uh, James Shapiro, who's um, an evolutionary biologist at the University of Chicago, you know, with incredibly good credentials, um, and about um, six other very highly reputable evolutionary biologists uh, from the UK, for, from Israel, um, and putting forward the view. Then there were also about the same number of orthodox um, neo-Darwinians. And the debate was is fascinating to watch um, because all the neo-Darwinians would say is, well, yes, yes. Well, this may be true, but it's important. Uh, it was sad, but I hope this that meeting will become the first step of a turning point, um, because it's it, it's what Thomas Kuhn described as a scientific paradigm. Um, a scientific theory is developed, um, and the the people who proposed it get positions of power in universities. They teach um, their, the people who will take their place and they teach what they, their reputation has been based on. They, they respond defensively to any critiques of, 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 their, um, of their position. They're on, they're on the committees that review papers for publication. They're on the committees that give grants for further research. They've got tremendous positions of power. Um, but the evidence builds up and builds up slowly, you know, and then it crumbles. And this is what happened, uh, for example, in geology, when um, May have lost you there, John. We were struggling there with some signals for a little bit, and you uh, you uh, tapped out here. You may have to re-sign in. Um, not so sure. Uh, I'm pretty sure you're probably going off on a beautiful cognitive rampage right now that we all don't get to hear. 
uh, due to technology. Right. There you go. There you go. Now you're back. Perhaps I, I stopped. Was it Thomas couldn't describe the sequence to which scientific theories go? They're developed. Um, they're, de they're de then defended against increasing weight of evidence. The people ignore the evidence. There are impositions of power in universities and grant awarding committees on committees deciding which papers are published. Um, on committees which decide which, which which PhD students get career jobs and so on. So there are these positions of power. But the evidence builds up, builds up, builds up. And then finally, the thing crumbles. Uh, and, and this happened in geology. Um, Niels Bohr, for example, was told, um, look, what, don't waste your time on physics. We, we, everything, there's nothing new to be learned about physics. You know, Newton's explained it all. You know, thank goodness Neil Bohr ignored them and went on to be one of the co-founders of, 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 of quantum theory, which uh, was a huge advance. So we're in, age, uh, in cosmology and in evolutionary biology in the UK and the USA, um, where the pe people are the resistant mode. But, you know, the change will happen, Adam. Well, you start to see, I'm seeing it a lot more, where you're seeing so-called peer-reviewed articles and journals being questioned and the process to which these articles come to uh, the light for us to read, to study. Uh, and yeah, I see, I'm seeing that more and more at least, us willing to question the science, right? Before it was just no science says, you blew my mind at the beginning of this podcast that the Big Bang Theory itself is not even scientific because you can't retest the theory and apply the scientific uh, method to it. Yep. It, yeah. seem, it seems no matter what we do, the corruption of, of what we known. want to be known and studied is what comes out. Um, right, and so I, I was interested in, in, in finding out what um, science actually is. Um, another thing that um, most biologists say that um, we differ only um, in degrees from other animals, um, but in fact, um, what marked our emergence, some 25 years ago um, wasn't the shape or size of our skulls or that we walked upright or that we like bodily these are different these are differences in degrees from other animals but actually what makes us unique is reflective consciousness and so book isn't it isn't just about a critique of current scientific theories it actually investigates what science, what evidence base is there and draws on and develops a theory. And consciousness is a characteristic, if I could just explain, consciousness is a characteristic of, of living things as distinct from an inanimate matter, a uh, thing like a rock. It's possessed in rudimentary form by all living species, by the simplest species like bacteria. Now, in the evolutionary lineage leading to humans, consciousness increased with increasing neural complexity and conduct with but knows that it knows. There you go. Can you please, re John? Can you please recover that again? You you clipped out at a part. I was hanging on the hanging on a oh. toenail there. It was uh, so. What's subconscious and where it came from? And we lost you. Right. Uh, uh, this is the characteristic of a living thing as distinct from an inanimate, inanimate thing like a rock. It's, it's possessed in rudimentary form by the simplest species, bacteria. In the evolutionary lineage leading to humans, consciousness increased with increasing neural complexity and centration in the brain until, with humans, it became conscious of itself. We're the only species that not only knows, but knows that it knows. 
we reflect on ourselves and our place in the cosmos. We ask questions like, what are we? Where do we come from? Why do we exist? The self-reflective consciousness, Adam, has transformed abilities and generated new ones. It's transformed comprehension, learning, invention, and communication, which all other animals have in varying degrees. We have them in much greater degree, but importantly, it generated new abilities, completely new abilities like imagination, insight, abstraction, written language, belief, morality that no other animal has. So the possession of reflective consciousness marks a difference in kind, not merely degree from other animals. Just as there is a difference in kind between inanimate matter like a rock and living things like bacteria and animals. Does that make sense? For sure. In your investigation over 10 years, did you happen to come across anything that would support where consciousness came from or how it developed or or how how it came to be? I mean, I've, I've, I've obviously heard things like Terrence McKenna's uh, stoned ape theory and ideas of where consciousness came from. Um, what did you find along the way about uh, where it came from or how uh, how it manifested? Um. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll take the manifestation first because that's easier to answer. It's manifested in bed. So you can correlate increasing consciousness with increasingly sophisticated behavior. Um, let me give one extreme example. Um, in the 1960s, an ape was discovered open a nut with a stone in order to get the kernel of the nut for food and anthropologists said gosh chimpanzees are human they, they use tool use or humans are the third chimpanzee you know they're not different than us um, and that became the third chimpanzee became the title of the book by Jared Diamond, which won the 1991 Royal Society's Prize for Science Books. Well, if you think about it, Adam, um, chimpanzees have been breaking open individual, an individual, individual chimpanzees and breaking open nuts with a rock for at least 4,300 years. Since that time, nothing has changed. Where would compare be the, that, you're, you're, right? You're saying where would be the next chimp? Then, if it's four thousand years of using the tool, where would be the next step toward us? Well, if you compare that with one hundred thousand scientists from over one hundred countries cooperating, and I mentioned the coordination, cooperation. This is how we evolve: cooperating to design build and operate the Large Hadron Collider to investigate primordial matter and energy near the beginning of the universe and say, well, that's just the same kind of tool as a single chimpanzee cracking open a nut. I'm sorry, I don't buy it. You know, there's a huge <laughs> difference about behavior, you know. That is rather different behavior than cracking open a nut to get their food individually. <laughs> yeah, slightly more complicated. Um, yes, I, 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 and, and as I said, it involves, you know, cooperation and uh, complexity uh, and so on. Uh, so I, uh, I, the evidence certainly shows that as far as we know, that we humans are unique, not just different in, in, in kind from other animals. There's not one whit of evidence that shows that other animals, uh, they, they, uh, they cooperate, but they co they cooperate uh, for two reasons: for mutual survival and for pro procreation. Um, that's that. The, the, those are the two functions of other animals. We actually go beyond that. Um, we compose symphonies, you know, which have no 
uh, survival, reproductive value at all. Um, we write novels. We ex we send. Uh, the, the irony of it was irony, uh, Adam. At the same time, this this um, uh, the chimpanzee was spotted cracking open a nut. Um, that NASA had launched the Voyager spacecraft um, to go not only to our solar system but beyond the solar system um, and contained a, a, a golden disk with all with the attributes of, of, of what it was to be human uh, on that golden disk and as an introduction um, um, by the president of the USA uh, and by Carl Sagan and it it had Mozart symphonies on, and it had uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci drawing of man. It had mathematics, you know, all the things that make us different from everybody else. Um, and this was sent off at the same time that um, the anthropologist said, you know, we, we're, we're exactly the same as chimpanzees, just a difference in degree, you know. Do you think it's the idea, because I, I seem that humans almost have an incessant need to know, and we recognize patterns, and many times patterns that aren't even there. And is it sometimes that maybe we rely on science so much just to try to give us answers to things, and that when someone like, say, Darwin puts a, a, a theory out there that seems to make sense and seems to be, uh, correlate, seems to be correlated, we tend to just go, yeah, that's an answer. That's close enough. I see a pattern, and we just run with that. Yeah, but we should only run with it when the, that is consistent evidence, where it's not. We, we, we should change the theory. And that's essentially um, what you're saying, is that we're building and growing and cultivating <laughs> theories that don't match our own scientific model, that, that don't even match what they say they're backed by. Yeah, exactly. Um, oh, shit, man. <laughs> and, 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 uh, 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 Homo sapiens is, not, is, not, is the only known species that is still evolving. Uh, this is another conclusion I reached in, in the book. Um, so our evolution is not morphological, the physical characteristics, or genetic, but noetic. All, all, all species have sort of adaptive changes, but these are reversible. Um, so you can get, I mean, people in uh, sub-Saharan Africa are you know, much less in weight than people in the USA. It's a matter of diet. So you can reverse all these morphological changes. You've got a diet, you can reverse it. You can feed the people in sub-Saharan Africa, then they're no longer emaciated. So um, I'm not talking about reversible changes, I'm talking about irreversible changes. And so our evolution is not the physical characteristics or genetic, but noetic. It's an evolution of the mind, and it's been occurring in th three overlapping phases primeval, philosophical, and scientific. Primeval thinking was dominated by the foreknowledge of death and the need to survive when humans first emerged. Um, and it, they had the capacity of imagination. And imagination gave rise to superstition, a belief that usually arises from a lack of understanding of natural phenomena or fear of the unknown. And it's evidenced by legends and myths, the beliefs in animism, totemism, and ancestor worship of hunter-gatherers, to polytheism in the city-states, where the pantheon of gods reflected the social hierarchy of their societies, the chief god being representative of you know, Jove, Jupiter, whatever, the, the, the chief guy in the society. And finally to a monotheism in which other gods were demoted to angels or subsumed into one god, reflecting the, the absolute power of king or emperor. Um, the, the instinct for competition and aggression, which had been ingrained over millions of years of pre-human ancestry, remained a powerful characteristic of humans. 
interacting with and dominating reflective consciousness, which was, you know, just emerging. It didn't snap fully formed, it gradually evolved. And, and, and the second phase of reflective consciousness, philosophical thing emerged roughly 1500 to 500 before the current era. It was characterized by humans going beyond superstition to use reasoning and insight, often at a disciplined meditation, to answer questions. And in, in, in all cultures, it produced the ethical view that we should treat all others, including our enemies, as ourselves. And this ran counter to the predominant instinct of aggression and competition. The third phase of reflective consciousness, um, scientific thinking, gradually emerged from natural philosophy in approximately 1600 of the current era. It branched into the physical sciences, the life sciences, and medical sciences, which then branched into further specializations, as I mentioned at the beginning. But interestingly, physics, the fundamental science, then started to con converge, rapidly so, in the last 65 years, towards a single theory that describes all the interactions between all forms of matter. And according to this view, all physical phenomena are lower energy manifestations of a single energy at the beginning of the universe. This is similar in very many respects to the insights of philosophers that there is an underlying energy in the cosmos that gives rise to all matter and energy. And during the last 65 years, reflective consciousness also produced an increase in technology that leads to a convergence in humankind through globalization, like just as we are interacting now. You know, I, I'm talking with you um, from, from London um, 65 years ago um, and seeing you and seeing me, I hope, we wouldn't, we, this wouldn't, we wouldn't be doing this. You know, this globalization, you know, is, 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 is happening now. A reduction in aggression, an increase in cooperation and altruism, and the ability to determine our own future. Now, this whole process, Adam, has been accelerating. So primary thinking emerged roughly 25,000 years ago. Philosophical thinking emerged about 2,000 years ago. Scientific thinking emerges about 400 years ago. While convergent thinking begins barely 65 years ago. So it's, it's a, human evolution is rapidly accelerating. And by examining the evidence, not the dogma, but the actual evidence of our evolution from primordial matter and energy at the beginning of the universe, we see, we see a consistent pattern of the evidence. This shows that we humans are the unfinished product of accelerating cosmic evolutionary process characterized by a combination increased complexity and convergence and uniquely as far as we know we are the self-reflective agents of our future evolution it's within our gift to de decide whether we shall continue to evolve or whether we shall destroy ourselves and our planet no other species has got that ability we have that ability which presents us with a challenge does that make yeah. sense? It does it. I, I, I'm sorry, but I can be a logical person, even step back and see that. I see that it's almost as like we know that we have to work together. You see this half of the world going work together, the other half of the world going, no, leave us alone, uh, take care of ourselves. And, and this idea of competition that kind of drives our social dogma of our economy, right? Of what development means and competition and we're still stuck there. Then you see guys like uh, Jacques Fresco that are, you know, building the Venus Project and have ideas of no leaders and and working together and growing. I mean, it seems so logical to me just hearing it like this. And obviously there's researcher bias. If I'm going to write a book called uh, Evolution or Evolutionary Theory, then I'm going to have a biasy in what I'm writing or what I've discovered. And 
uh, hearing you is all of that bias exists and all we're doing is building on top of things that aren't even scientific and not even looking at the evolution. I mean, you're blowing my mind on the idea that we've been so focused on the physical evolution of what we are uh, and ignoring the, the mental evolution and how far we really are from chimps or anything else they want to say that we're close to. And when we work together, how, f how much further we go uh, when we do collaborate and pull together. And, you know, many times, and, and tell me if I'm off here or wrong, but I, I've said, and I'll get shit for it, I'm sure, uh, is the idea when science and an idea of something spiritual come together, I used to say, is when we'll start to actually figure shit out. But when we're still going, nope, it's science, nope, it's spiritual, I'm using a very vague word, I, I, word I know. But the idea is that they're, they're so dogmatically pitted against each other that we're not using what we've evolved to do, which is collaborate together for growth. Nope, I, 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 I've lost you. You cut there, Adam. Um, yeah, I was. Hello? Uh, yeah, I'm here. I still got you. Yeah, I was uh, I was basically just going off on a, on a rampage that I'll, I'm sure I'll get some shit for, which is the idea I used to say that. Uh, maybe when the idea that science is not so dogmatic and neither is religion or spirituality, forgive the, the vague term, the subjective term, but when they start to work together almost is when we'll maybe get real answers instead of being embedded in, in dogmas and ideas. This is, this is absolutely right. I, I actually avo avoided using the word spiritual um, in the book because that is usually associated culturally with a, b a belief in an interventionist God. Um, uh, I with, with no, I was born and educated as a Catholic. I became an atheist, and then I became an agnostic. And I really did not know. I had an open mind, and this is how I approach looking at the evidence. And what I found surprised me, and and I've tried to go with actually what I found. But we talk about consciousness and and science, you know, not spirituality. Then, whilst reductionists, and all the specialization ha has been tremendous, and you know, and breaking up there, John. I, I'm not. There you go. Um without seeing the whole is um, incomplete. You can't just focus on, on the leaf, you've got to see the whole. And this is where quantum theorists you know, have, 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 have argued um, that all, all the leaders of quantum theory, the originators of quantum theory, um, were very much um, in terms of having the same philosophy as sort of the ancient philosophers who saw the cosmos as a whole, that it consists of you know, a, an underlying a, a, a energy which underlies all matter and physical energy. And you've got to look at it as a whole. Um, so reductionist methods can explain things which you can very simply parcel out and focus on. But it can't explain, um, to come back to your question that you asked me earlier, that I said I'd come back to, about consciousness. You, know, you can identify almost, you know, what activity is happening in the, when you're thinking. But what you can't do is experience the thought itself. Those uh, co cognitive neuroscientists who say, well, we map the brain, we know that when you're thinking this, and interacting, when you're thinking that, these neurons are interacting. But unless you actually, you cannot share what those thoughts are. Um, it's, it's, it's difference between quantitative and qualitative. Um, so there are limitations within the de domain of science and i've got i've, I've got a chapter called limitations uh, of science the limitations within the domain of science things like um evidence that um they're trying to find 
maybe they will find evidence for dark matter failed to find it so far but they've been looking at years maybe they will so that that's a possibility i don't discount that at all but there are then then there are things that you that you have no idea to expect that that, that you, you come across um so the idea that one of the fundamental forces is is called you know, the weak nuclear force that, that was even not thought of 50 years ago it's now regarded as one of the fundamental forces of matter um electromagnetism the idea that, um magnetism and electricity are just different aspects of, of the same force you know, uh, 500 years ago that wasn't thought to be the case now it is it's all converging towards that and we're looking at a whole a cosmos which is a transcend is both transcendent transcendent and part of we are part of you know cosmos we are linked inevitably with all other parts of this cosmos and through our consciousness and how it arises um we don't know i suspect there is a reality beyond which and it's only suspicion it's not scientific evidence but adam just as a difference between inanimate matter you know a rock doesn't understand that it's the sun that's making it hot um bacteria through to chimpanzees you know, don't understand that there are black holes out there and there are there's a universe which may or may not be infinite in extent but perhaps there's a reality that we we do understand beyond that i don't know i i, I leave that as yeah, a thought why not and, i mean we can be so uh, arrogant right uh, yes um I, and we've got to be humble about what we do know and what we don't know and it, 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 it's it's it, it, one of my pleas in the book and is, is is to have humility um and I have to say, I, I, I was asked a question at the book fair um, about the difference between male and females, and, and I thought about this, and I had to say, well, actually, when I've questioned scientists, the most dogmatic scientists have been male scientists, and the, the scientists with the most open mind who were prepared to look at the evidence have tended to be women. Um, I, so, I, I think um, we can use a little uh, women running in our country a little bit, a little bit backing off the ego, maybe, right? A little uh, openness and humility yeah. to learn and work together as a group, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, there's um, something else I, I ponder sometimes that maybe uh, I, I think about the idea when I think about the Big Bang Theory explanation or anything else. It seems to come back always to this... Uh, immaculate beginning right this it was just here and it just started and then we know the rest of it from here and as you explained in the beginning half of that we haven't even been able to prove but we hang our hat on it uh rather than question and what you just brought up really uh really moved i guess inside for from my mind was the idea that if all of these animals at certain levels be the rock be the dog be the chimp uh the bacteria that all have a different level they can't even seem to understand why then ourselves wouldn't there be another realm that we possibly can't see study and, and plus all we have is our own brain to study our own brain so it's it's almost as if like we have one tool to measure the tool that we're measuring and that's all we have right but i mean i i i just um just give a, a few examples uh, in your introduction you said it's a seven page book it's actually seven seven hundred page book um cosmos Athens. um i i i i've just given a, a few a few a few things from it um but if anyone is interested in pursuing it further then um i i would suggest that that, that they do read it. Um, one one of the best reviews on um, on Amazon that that it had was um, 
the, 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 the guy gave it a five star uh, and, and, then, and then came back and said, I'd like to increase that because I read it the first time around and I thought it was fantastic. And then I've gone back to it and each time I've read it, I've got more out of it. So it, it's something, it is big. Um, it's not to be, you know, it, it's, the, there are some areas which are technical, we've used images, you know, diagram pictures to try and convey complex technical ideas. You know, a picture can be worth a thousand words. Um, but I've also, in some areas, said, well, if you find, if, if some bits you find too technical, then I, my conclusions are at the end of the chapter. I draw conclusions to the chapter. So you, you can read it at whatever level you have. So a complete novice to science can read it and understand it. And the scientists can, because the science is there as well, if, 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 you, if you want to read it. Um, so that's, um, it, it, it's just, a, as I said, what we're able to do in this hour is just give a, a few tastes of a few of the things that are in it. I understand. Was there, I, I was interested, was there something or maybe the one biggest thing that as you were researching uh, unbiasedly as possible going through it that hit you where you went, oh my, oh my, and just kind of blew you back a minute and, and maybe you had to reset or restart. What was some a conclusion or some findings uh, other than what we've discussed now, which are a lot as well, but was there one or two in particular that really blew you away? Well, I think the things that, the thing that re really blew me away um, was that I hadn't appreciated um, how unique humans are and that we are the only species that is evolving and future evolution is in hands and that we are part, we, we cannot divorce ourselves from the rest of the cosmos of which we are part, and we are part through our consciousness. It's by our reflective consciousness, consciousness that we can interact and be part of this huge cosmos. Um, and I find that quite mind blowing. As well, and the more research you see in many fields from psychology, anywhere else we see about social connection theory, the idea of being connected, and those when we feel anxiety, depression, these are things when we're not connected, when we don't feel like we're involved. And so, even I joke around sometimes about how, oh, I'm just a, a, a monkey. Sorry, just, you, you broke up. Um, I was, I was, you I was, broke uh, up there. Oh, sorry. I was speaking about how even in psychology, my, my side of the, the field of study is you're beginning to see more and more how what you're saying is relevant in even just psychology, that social connection theory, the idea when people feel disconnected, uh, our mental ten tends to go down, uh, what happens when we are connected and working together and helping others, even just on that small little field of psychology, you're seeing uh, blips of what you're writing about to be so. Uh, on how we evolve, how we get better, right? Because we isolate when we're getting depressed. We uh, begin to think of ourselves as not very worthy or very special. And, and almost when we start to think anti-human and what you're really discovering is when we start to find that toil and the issues in the world, et cetera. Did I lose you there at the end? Sorry. <laughs> you broke up. No worries. I, I, I went through it twice. But I'm basically just kind of pointing out in my field of psychology what we're seeing that you're, you're yeah. reporting on is the idea of social connection being uh, almost how we do evolve. How, uh, and when we're not socially connected, how we actually de-evolve, if you will, right? When we're not connected, when we're not helping, uh, we become isolated. We become uh, jagged. We become very selfish in a way and move backwards. And so even in my field, we're seeing of what you're writing about to be so and how we will further ourselves and an understanding of being connected. And I'm like I was saying, I'm guilty very much sometimes when I joke around to say, I'm just a chimp, you know, I'm such an animal, I'm, I'm primal, I'm this. And I think I'm really doing a disservice to the human being, I think, by saying, oh, we're just animals all trying to, to get along or we're, we're nothing further than the chimpanzee. And I think, we, I think I'm really discounting what the human species really is and is capable of. 
Yes, uh, as I said, don't forget that we've got several million years inheritance of pre-human ancestry of aggression, competition, hierarchism, and that is actually still dominant. The um, the, the, the cooperation, um, convergence, um, altruism, this has been rapidly increasing. It hasn't yet overtaken um, the aggressive instincts. But if you, if you look at one of the graphs in the book, uh, you can see that the, 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 the competition and aggression is, is, is decreasing, the cooperation, altruism, convergence is increasing. It hasn't yet overtaken. And in a, a sequel to Co Cosmos Sapiens, we'll look at projecting what happens when it does overtake. So as of now, we're we're Jekyll and Hyde. We're still you know, partially working on instincts, which which are aggressive, but we overcome that. Uh, unlike unlike a chimp, if if, if 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 you see an attractive woman there, you don't go out and have sex with her when she wants it. Um, we we've got the ability to overcome these these urges through active consciousness because. Either you know that that we respect the woman as a person, or, or we respect the laws that that's been made for society to work. Uh, we can overcome our aggressive instincts, but we can go much further. And this is this is what is is fascinating uh, for me now to look at in future in the sequel to Cosmos Sapiens. But it's um, it won't take as long as ten years. Um, because uh, you know all the evidence is 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 there in that book. What I get from the book when when I go through it honestly is more hope than I do anything of a, a critique on cosmo uh, cosmetology. Listen, cosmetology on cosmo cosmo cosmology or science or any theory. I, I really take it in as almost hope. And at the end of this podcast here, as we're talking. Um, I feel that hope, right? And it seems like a hope is almost like hope, love. These seem to be the emotions that we draw on in order to become a collective consciousness, right? That we're, we're using those feelings or those creations, whatever hope and love is, it seems to be like the paths of collectiveness or a collective consciousness. Yes. Um, as I said, we uniquely we've got it within our power to determine our own evolutionary future and that of the planet. Um, no other species have that. We can do that for good or for ill. We can destroy ourselves. We can destroy the planet, or we can continue to evolve. Um, I find on balance that I'm sharing the hope that we will continue to overcome the aggressive instincts and we will continue to evolve and continue to protect the planet. And yeah. I share that hope. Oh, I, I so have that hope. And I'm, I'm, do, if you don't have to go, I just had a few more questions, if it's all right. Um, okay. Just a few, if you may, right? All right, yeah, we'll, we'll zap through them. The, well, the idea, though, um, when I talk from a religious sense even, right, You there's a lot of people that go, well, it's written in the book, right? We know how it's going to end, and they kind of proceed with that dogma of I can't change anything, the world's ending anyway, and it seems a real lack of hope on that side almost. Um, how do you kind of take into account for the religious aspects that come into some of the religious dogma, I should say, that come into our evolution or our future? Um, yeah, well, it, 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 it <coughs> excuse me, it, it is dogma. Um, and as I said, the, the religions have been based, um, it's, it's not that we are images of God. We made God in our image throughout, throughout the whole history of humankind. As I said, from the you know from animism, totemism, and so on, to polytheism and monotheism, the, the, they re so the, the the gods had and the dogma have reflected um, human societies, and they become matters of belief. I mean, what is um, typical for all religions is that you know 
you start out, uh, I mean, you just take the Christian religion, which I'm, most of you have quite a good knowledge of, of other religions. Um, Jesus was, was promulgating a doctrine of love, and yet his so-called success of the Pope you know, was leading holy wars and crusades and inquisitions and so on. So the followers tended to distort the fundamental message of the originator of the religion, um, which is mirrored in, in some ways with, <laughs> with, with what is happening in science. And so I, I, it, it's, whether it's dogma in science or dogma in um, religion, um, that does not appeal to me. I, I, I want to look at um, what we know, uh, not what we believe blindly, because somebody's written it down. Um, if you talk about you know, the, the literal truth of the Bible, well, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are actually quite different. You know, they can't both be right. So if someone says, I believe in the literal truth, Truth of the Bible about creationism. Well, my answer is, my question is, well, are you talking about Genesis 1 or Genesis 2? Because they, they contradict each other in, mm -hmm. in terms of. Uh, you still there, John? I think you dropped out right there at the last second. Uh, see if you'll come back in is uh believe it or not uh, allow um man to just, yep there you are now you came back you were talking about genesis one and two and uh uh which one do you believe and then cut out yeah yeah well i, I don't need to repeat that <laughs> all right well my last question <laughs> honestly um uh, is probably going to be a long one for you maybe not i don't know but um in in your study and your understanding research where do we come from, John? Um, that um, I do not know, and I hope I, you know, I'm. I don't have the arrogance of saying that I do know. I hope I've got the humility to say, having looked at all the evidence, no, I do not. Ultimately, where where we came from, um, I do not know. And so it's a speculation that there's a higher, that there's a reality beyond which our minds are incapable of grasping. But I've got the, the humility to say, well, I hope to come out and say, if you don't know, I do not know. Ultimately, we'll be capable. Beautiful. And I think that's something where science needs to step back to is if you don't know, you know, what's Sherlock Holmes say? Don't use theories to shoot facts, but facts to shoot theories. Right. I'll take that Sherlock Holmes uh, exit. <laughs> right. Well, it's been good talking with you, Adam. Uh, you as well, John. Uh, I would love to have you back on any time to even maybe go into the later chapters of the book uh, rather than just uh, the forward and then chapters one of the 700 page uh, hope for uh, the homo sapien, if you will. Um, I, I, it does give me hope, John, and I appreciate all the 10 years of work in uh, adding to our growth, adding to... Uh, I think a different perspective and a new look on science itself, on our creation itself. And uh, thank you. I, I applaud the work and thank you very much for dedicating such a large amount of what we think today is our most valuable uh, currency is time on the study of us and where we come from. Thank you. It's been my pleasure, Adam. And when, uh, your, when your next book comes out, will you come on and uh, walk us through that one? I'd be delighted to do that. Oh, it's a blessing. I appreciate it, John. Thank you so much, man. Thank you for coming on and sharing. I'm going to go uh, ponder the world now for about four hours and stare at the sky and go, oh, my God. <laughs> okay. Take care, man. Thank you. Great. Take care. Bye. Bye.